All right, this is Dr. Cox again. We're gonna go over the last module, which is Global Package Obstetrics and Gynecologic Surgery for the coding and documentation for resident education. This is provided by ACOG and CREAG and was created by the physicians listed below, so we're grateful to them for this. All right, so moving on. Our educational objectives are to be able to describe the global package, define the components of global surgical package, operative report documentation and modifiers that we use, what are the components of the global obstetric package, and review general coding rules for obstetrics, including coding for antepartum delivery and postpartum services. So when you do multiple procedures for gynecologic surgery, you get paid 100% for the first procedure and 50% for each procedure thereafter. And your known total RVUs for each procedure um, to determine which procedure to list as the primary because you want to list the one with the most RVUs. There's also global periods that are defined for each pr procedure. And for Medicare, it's either zero, 10, or 90 days. And how do you know what that is? Well, if you go to that RBU table again, it's gonna tell you the global surgical days. It'll also tell you the total number of RBUs for each procedure so that you can list procedures correctly. Postoperative complications and global fees. So global fees generally cover all additional medical or surgical services required of the surgeon during the postoperative period of surgery because of complications, which don't require additional trips to the operating room. If you go back to the operating room, that is a billable fee. So what is the CPT code for a TBH, RSO, NRSO repair, and Birch Copal urethropexy? It's a lot of things. So you want to find the code that's going to encompass the most and then you can potentially add a modifier on. So if you look at the different options listed here, obviously the first and the last option are kind of what you are able to bundle the most together. So if you have something that has the TBH, anorosial repair, USO, BSO, which is the majority of the things that you did, and then you add the modifier on for the birch, that's going to be your secondary procedure. That most likely is the most correct code. The last option is considered unbundling, which is going to get denied. So you want to pick the code that bundles the most procedures together. That should also be your highest RVU valued procedure. So the best answer, answer is going to be that first one. And you're going to get 100% of the first procedure and 50% of the birch. So again, you want to list that primary procedure with mo most RVUs. Unilateral versus bilateral. So what if you do a bilateral procedure? Most procedures in OBGYN pay the same for unilateral and bilateral procedures. However, there's some exceptions. And again, if you go back to that RVU table, it'll tell you if bilateral procedures are paid together or separate. So you'll see a yes or no. So co-surgeon versus assistant. If your partner is helping you, some procedures allow for payment of co-surgeons or assistant. A co-surgeon receives 62.5% of allowable amount versus an assistant surgeon receives 16%. Primary surgeon still receives 100%. And how do you know if that's allowed? Again, on your RVU table, it will tell you. An assistant surgeon is the same specialty. A co-surgeon is a different board, boarded specialty. So... If you needed gynonc in your surgery, that would be a co-surgeon. If you had an, another OBGYN, that's going to be an assistant surgeon. Maybe requires documentation of medical necessi necessity for both surgeons. So if you see that may be listed in the column, then you are going to have to justify why you had it. Modifiers are used to describe special circumstances, and we use these in the clinic as well as in the OR. It's unusual events, a service that was provided more than once. If the service was prolonged, if there was an un, if um, there was a service unrelated to the original surgery or procedure, or it's mandated by a third party carrier, those are all reasons that you may document a modifier. <coughs> So these are the different modifiers that we usually see. 
in our practice. So 22 is going to be a procedure requiring significantly more um, work than typical. Sometimes you can use that in laparoscopic procedure if there was significant adhesive, adhesive disease or in a C-section if there was significant adhesive disease. 24 is an unrelated E&M service during the post-operative period. So if somebody comes in with breast pain and they had a hysterectomy, that would be a modifier 24. Um, significant separable, separately identifiable, identifiable E&M service on the same day procedure. That's going to be your IUD placements, endometrial biopsy. If somebody comes in with abnormal uterine bleeding that you complete on the same day as your initial visit. 26 is professional component only, 32 is mandated services, 52 is a reduced service or procedure, and that's usually when a procedure cannot be completed, like IUD placement, endometrial biopsy. You can still bill for those, but for reduced services. <clears throat> and then modifier 57 is an E&M service that resulted in decision for surgery on the day of or day before surgery. So generally, insurers will not pay for an office visit and a procedure on the same day unless you apply those modifiers. So modifier 25 is the most important one here. So again, an example of a patient being seen for abnormal uterine bleeding, you evaluate and you perform the endometrial biopsy on the same day, the same visit would justify that modifier. For procedure only visits, if the patient presents for the procedure only, you shouldn't um, bill an E&M code. So an example of that would be if you um, are doing a colposcopy following an abnormal cervical cytology at a preventative visit, you would only bill for the colposcopy. So here are some different examples. So. Class B, type, uh, class B type 1 diabetic at 25 weeks hospitalized for blood glucose control. You're going to want to go to your tabular list under complications of pregnancy, childbirth, and the parapurum um, para in your ICD-10 manual, and you'll see that there is an O code for pre-existing type 1 diabetes in pregnancy, second trimester, uh, and what the reason for hospitalization is, which is going to be hyperglycemia, there's another code for that, and then the week's gestation can be listed. Number two, 38-year-old G3P2 delivered vaginally at 39 weeks without complication. Um, again, there isn't a specific code for elderly multigravita in childbirth, therefore you simply use the codes that are available, so single live birth, vaginal delivery. Three is a 22-year-old delivered vaginally at 38 weeks over the third degree perineal laceration. So you do single live birth and also code for the third degree laceration. And the last one for non-purulent mastitis associated with lactation, this would re be reported as an ENM service with a 24 modifier because it's not part of the global. It's outside of that bundling. So obstetrical ultrasounds are also not in the global bundle. So you're going to utilize your CPT codes for ultrasound, BPP, NST, and they both have a professional and technical component. So when these per tests are performed in the physician's office, the global combined services is reported no modifier. But if you're performing them in the hospital, the facility actually will bill for the technical component. So the TC component, the, the physician will bill for the interpretation or you need to add on a 26 modifier. So to bill for ultrasound services, there has to be a report, documented findings, and notation of interpretation by the physician. And you want to refer to your CPT manual for instructions on reporting ultrasounds for multiples. So for global obstetrical package, it's defined uh, from the AMA CPT guidelines. So low risk obstetric care and delivery is, a, is an example of a bundle where a single CPT code covers the routine care and delivery. And physicians and hospitals are expected to manage the care in a cost effective manner that is high quality with excellent outcomes. Under CPT rules, antepartum delivery and postpartum care for routine 
Vaginal delivery forceps C-section VBAC and C-section after failed trial of labor should be billed as a single CPT code. And the components of that service should not be unbundled. And unbundling is when you try to bill for multiple CPT codes that are all actually billed under the same or have a bundled CPT code. So here you can see for vaginal delivery, C-section VBAC and C-section after failed TOLAC. So those would be the codes that you'd want to use for those. There is variation within carriers. Um, not all carriers are gonna follow CPT or CMS guidelines. So when you are writing the contract or looking at the contract with different insurance carriers, you wanna make sure you know what is what. Luckily for us at Sinai, we have billers so, and coders, so they know the ins and outs of that. But if you end up in private practice, you wanna make sure that you know what exactly they're looking for. So usually included in antepartum service is the initial and subsequent history and physical exams, monthly visits up to 28 weeks, biweekly visits up to 36 weeks, weekly visits until delivery. Any service is normally provided in uncomplicated pregnancies up to 13 visits, and after 13 visits, services may be billed separable after um, the delivery. The RVUs for global OB care is based on 13 visits. So when more than 13 visits are provided, those are sometimes reported separately after the delivery, but it's not always true. So if the patient um, is seen for addi additional visits for pregnancy-related risk factors but no complications develop, typically only the global package is really able to be um, reported and reimbursed. So excluded are the initial E&M service during which the pregnancy is diagnosed. So the first... So that initial uh, visit can be excluded from the global maternal or fetal ultrasound, any antepartum testing, inpatient admission, or subsequent visits for pregnancy complications. And those have to occur more than one calendar day before the delivery date, and then ECV are all billed separately. It's acceptable to bill for these services in addition to the global package, so the first obstetric visit is pretty time-consuming terms of history taking, etc. However, the initial OB visit <coughs> is valued into the global OB package as a 99215 established patient visit or a 99204 new patient visit um, when the global OB code values were initially established. So the diagnosis of pregnancy can be reported as a problem visit. And it should be coded under confirmation of pregnancy, and that is typically a low-level visit to confirm pregnancy. And then she's scheduled and brought back at a later date to initiate antepartum care. If any of the comprehensive work that is um, completed as part of the initial OB visit is performed and documented, that is considered a start of the initial OB global package. So you want to make sure if you're going to bill it like that, you do it at two separate as two separate visits. Unrelated visits, so unnecessary uh, visits for conditions unrelated to pregnancy should re be reported using e &M visit codes with the appropriate ICD-10 codes, and you want to bill for those services at the time they are rendered, and that's usually medical services that are provided that are unrelated to the pregnancy, so like URI symptoms, vaginitis, things like that can be billed separately. Complicated antepartum visits. If the total number of antepartum visits exceeds the 13 due to pregnancy complication, you want to report additional visits with an ENM visit code. So high-risk pregnancies, if the total number of visits again exceeds 13 due to a prior poor obstetrical outcome and no complications occur in this pregnancy, then you can only build the global. So note that there is a significant difference between a pregnancy that is complicated by a specific problem versus a pregnancy deemed high risk because of a prior poor obstetrical complication. So for example, a patient with a history of a 25-week preterm delivery can have up to 18 antenatal visits due to your vigil vigilance and efforts to prevent another preterm delivery. If she subsequently does not have preterm labor or any other antenatal problems with this pregnancy, the extra five visits should not be billed in addition to the global OB3. However, if she does develop preterm labor or other antenatal problems with this pregnancy, you are justified in billing those extra five visits due to um, using a problem-oriented E&M codes. 
with the appropriate ICD-10 code to define medical necessity for those additional medical services. The ACOG coding course um, <clears throat> is now making a distinguish, distinction between at risk, the patient should be more closely monitored due to some past issue, and high risk, the patient has a condition that requires close monitoring. So high risk would be chronic hypertension, and at risk pregnancy would be history of preeclampsia with severe features. So you just have to be careful on how those look, how those are billed. <clears throat> if you're going to bill antepartum care only, it's when patient transfers obstetric care to another practice, or a patient is transferred to another MD like MFM during the antenatal period. The patient is delivered by another MD not associated with, with your practice. This would be something that you could bill for, or the pregnancy ends prior to viability, or the patient changes insurance during pregnancy. That would be all antepartum care only. It's divided into a different number of visits. So one to three, you use an e and visit code only. Four to six, you can see there, and then seven plus is a different code. For delivery, it's included in the services. Uh, when you're billing a global, however, if you are billing delivery only, it includes admission history and exam, management of labor, plus minus induction, insertion of cervical dilator on day of delivery, simple cerclage removal, delivery with vaginal C-section, forces or vacuum, delivery of the placenta plus or minus manual removal, and then episiotomy and repair are all included in that. Services that are excluded, additional services in L&D management, which are not normally provided and which were not rendered more than one calendar day before delivery. ECV is excluded and ex insertion of cervical dilators on a day other than the day of delivery can also be built. So when you're looking at the different RBU values for global delivery only and delivery and postpartum care, you can see there that the RBU values are significantly different and that's just based off of what um, what you are providing and this is based on the 2017 update so those last two the delivery only and delivery and postpartum care would be if you didn't provide any antepartum services or antenatal visits and that would be used for patients who come in with no care So postpartum services are usually routine inpatient care immediately after delivery and a routine outpatient visits after delivery. It excludes treatment of postpartum complications or other conditions unrelated to the pregnancy. So medical services for diagnosis and treatment of postpartum complications that are not normal or typical, so breast abscesses, episiotomy breakdowns, or other conditions unrelated to the pregnancy like DBT, pyelonephritis, those should be billed as a problem-oriented E&M service in addition to the global OB or postpartum fee that we bill. So obstetric modifiers, again, 22 is increased services, 24 is unrelated um, during the post-op period, 25 is significant services rendered on the same day outside of your E&M code, 26 is your professional component only, and 51 is multiple procedures. So what are the CPT codes for the following? Antepartum services plus delivery of twin A vaginally and twin B C-section plus postpartum services. So that would be twin B would be a global package for the C-section and twin A would be plus minus a 51 modifier for vaginal delivery only, um, which would get half and that would be the 23.58 RVUs. And then the next one, antepartum services plus delivery of twin A and B by C-section for transverse lie and postpartum services. So it would be tw twin A and twin B would be 59510 with modifier 22 for extra services. And you have to include the operative report and letter justifying why you deserve more compensation than the standard global package for C-section. And that's because you delivered two infants by C-section. Um, it is appropriate to provide an additional amount or a percentage of inner service work that you think is justified by medical necessity based on the additional phys physician work performed during the delivery. Payers are rarely paying extra for twin cesarean deliveries since you provided antepartum services, a single cesarean incision, and postpartum services for a single patient, unless extra information is provided. 
Remember that you need the correct CPT code for medically necessary service, a correct ICD-10 code to support the CPT service um, code, and the service is covered by the patient's policy or contract. However, all of those things, again, are in your control. So the most common causes for not getting paid are going to be poor documentation. You didn't file the claim in a timely manner. Missing or misplaced information on the claim. So patient ID, date of service is not there or it's not a covered service. How do you get paid? You want to look at the explanation for the denial. Fix the problem fix the problem if there is one and resubmit it. And provide, make sure you're providing the information that they're asking for. You can resubmit your claim as it stands with a letter requesting reconsideration. And make sure you include why you did what you did in that letter. It's going to be a lot of work and it can take a lot of time and you may still not get reimbursed. So you want to make sure you do all the things right the first time <clears throat> with clear documentation, appropriate ICD-10 code, and CPT supported documents. Okay, so let's try some cases. Case one, Chelsea, a G1P0, 35 and zero gestation, presents to LND with decreased fetal movement. Dr. K is called and NST is ordered. The LND nurse calls Dr. Kensington with the findings. He asks her to reassure Chelsea and send her home with instructions. The following day, he interprets the NST and writes a report. So what can he bill for? So decreased fetal movement, 35 weeks gestation, can he bill for the triage visit? He cannot because he didn't see the patient. Can he bill for the NST? Yes, he can because he interpreted and wrote a report, uh, but you can only bill for the professional component since the hospital owns the machine. So your CPT code would be 59025 with modifier 26. 39 weeks, Chelsea returns to LND with possible contractions. LND calls Dr. Kensington who, who comes in and sees Chelsea. He examines her and reviews the NST. He documents his encounter and the NST interpretation. She is again sent home with instructions. So what can you bill for this time? So it's false labor after 37 weeks without delivery. Uh, 39 week gestation. He can bill for the triage visit because he saw the patient. It was a pro problem focused exam so the level of service will be dependent on how much work he did. And he can bill for that NST again with modifier 26 because the hospital still owns the equipment but he did write a report. So case number two, Tess. She's a 63-year-old female, last seen four years ago, so a new patient. She's here today with complaints of urinary urgency and frequency worsening over the last several months. She states that occasionally she can't make it to the bathroom in time, but it then takes her a long time to urinate. She also notes urine loss with cough and sneeze. She has not discussed the issues with her primary care physician who sees she sees periodically for hypercholesterolemia and routine exams. So you're, you document your review of systems. She denies burning on urination, vaginal bleeding, or discharge. She has not experienced loss of bowel control or other GI symptoms. Her weight has remained stable and all other systems are negative. You reviewed her past medical history. You review her social history as well. And then you do an exam, which is listed below. You document your impression, pelvic relaxation with third degree cystocele, possible UTI, mixed incontinence, and then you document your plan. What all can we bill for? So she is considered a new patient because she hasn't been seen in the practice in the last three years. Um, so you got your diagnoses, you did some labs, and how are you going to code it? It's generally going to be a 99203 because only a detailed history um, was completed and a comprehensive, the exam was not comprehensive. And remember with new patients, you have to have three out of three to be able to bill to the next level. <clears throat> and you could also bill this on time, which would be approximately 25 to 30 minutes. And that is detailed in the attached documents as well. So in the next case, 22-year-old established patient with complaints of mild vaginal itching and irritation for the last couple days. You do an exam, you diagnose her with vaginal candidiasis, you give her a treatment, and she can return PRN. So diagnosis of vaginal candidiasis, you did a wet prep. And what's your code? A 99212. You cannot bill higher than a level 2. You could have billed higher. Um, 
with a level three with a review of systems and one additional system of exam if it is medical medically necessary to do this. I would say you're definitely going to do um, a review of systems. And for your components of exam, you could have definitely likely done one extra component as well. You could also bill based off of time. Case number four, chief complaint is girl center vulva. Anna is a 22 year old female who's been seen multiple occasions for perineal vaginal condyloma. Um, today she comes in with complaints of recurrent external lesions and mild vaginal itching. She first noted symptoms about two weeks ago. She has tried an OTC antifungal medication without relief. You did past medical history, social history, review systems for her. You're going to do a brief exam and a wet mount and you diagnose her with the same um, condylomalata. And the plan is the nature of the lesions and treatment you discussed with her and then you documented everything else. You're going to, um, you are going to do, you did a biopsy for her since she hasn't had a biopsy in the past and you're going to treat it with TCA on this, at this visit. So you also put your procedure note in. So you have your diagnosis, you did a lab, you did a procedure, and you're going to, you can bill 99213, and you can also do modifier 25 and 51. And it's a level three because you'd had an extended HPI and also um, moderate complexity. So modifier 25 for Visit plus procedures and modifier 51 for multiple procedures in this case. Okay. Finally, putting it all together, you're doing the work at the patient encounter. You want to make sure that you're documenting accurately what you did. Make sure you're converting that work into numerical codes and then charging for that work. And then you want to receive reimbursement for that work. So improving physician documentation and billing compliance, interval audits and feedback to physicians re regarding their documentation and whether it accurately reflects their work performed and supports the level of billing is important. So there's educational tools that can be used, um, dictation templates and E&M pop kit cards that can be used as well that can be purchased on ACOG.com. There's also technology like computer or PDA software that can help. And link documentation and billing software, which is what Epic is designed for, is to link documentation and billing together. It was not designed for patient care, per se. And there are references for the things that we utilized. Thank you all for joining me for this session. If you have any further questions or concerns, please let me know. And I also have ICD-10 ref uh, references and some billing information in my office if you ever want to see it. Thank you.